Have you contemplated the veracity of giants in the earth as outlined in Genesis 6? Do you wonder how so many of the megalithic structures around the world were built, which clearly surpassed man's understanding of mathematics and architectural design, all while incorporating the manufacturing of tools that were necessary to complete them? Or did you know that both the Old and New Testament writers captured the creation and reasonings behind these mutations of genetic engineering? Join Brian Del Turco from Jesus Smart Podcast as he interviews myself, Mark Russick, in breaking down what the Bible, our culture, and natural evidence reveals in The Promised Head Crusher versus the Nephilim. I am Mark Russick, and you are listening to The Russick Outlook. As always, just my opinion. Hello, everybody. My name is Mark Russick. You're listening to The Russick Outlook. Thank you so much for joining. Today's going to be a very special presentation, somewhat unique. I was recently asked to appear on a podcast hosted by Brian Del Turco out of the Northern Ohio area. Uh, it's titled JesusSmart.com, and it is an awesome program. Uh, not only this particular subject, but his podcast in general. I really encourage you to go check it out, subscribe to his channel. He's on all the major podcast platforms, including Amazon, if you wanted to uh, go over there and check it out. But he's got a, a very gifted approach, a very unique approach. He was uh, incredibly well prepared. So it, it, what I think, it, it really uh, precipitated some engaging conversations, a very frank conversation about the Nephilim. Who are they? Uh, as many of you know, if you're listeners here, you know, we've covered this uh, from a variety of, of subject areas or sub-subject areas, I would say, if that's a word. Um, but, but he, so he kind of, uh, really, uh, I, I guess because it was a, a very casual conversation, but we really did start to get into some of the meat of it. This is a two part series. I should preface that this is part one, uh, where, where we kind of introduce it and break it down. But, but again, he's, he's really very gifted in this area as, as an announcer or an announcer or, or as, as one who hosts the program in interviews, um, and, and we kind of, we, we went into popular culture. Uh, we talked about the penetration of the messianic bloodline, who are the, the Nephilim, the sons of God, and, and the daughters of men. And we talked about how that's three distinct categories that are broken down in Genesis 6-4. So th this is really what we're, what we're going to be doing. But I, I, again, I, I, I really encourage you to go visit uh, JesusSmart.com. And there's a picture here on video of uh, Brian and his lovely wife, Penny. And I understand he also has four daughters. So he's got his, a house full of women who are keeping him in line, I'm sure. Uh, but, but again, please do that. The, the title uh, of, of this is called Head Crusher versus the Nephilim. And by that, we're, we're referencing uh, Jesus and, and the, what was really the first prophecy in the Bible where he was... Uh, or I should say the death sentence was issued to Satan and how that would appear. And much of what uh, came about with the Nephilim and the uh, attempted abduction of the bloodline leading up to the Messiah. So we, we get into all of that here. Um, but let me just pause for one second. If you wouldn't mind, uh, please hit the like and subscribe button here for the Russick Outlook. Uh, it, it, again, if, if, if you enjoy or appreciate subject matters like this, it always helps us get the information out and uh, share, share the information, share the video, share the audio, share the podcast. And when you go over to JesusSmart.com, do the same, share, share that information, because I'm sure you'll find an array of subject areas there that uh, will, will be very, very rewarding. So uh, on that note, last, let me just close by saying, could you please jump on to the Russick Outlook, sign up for our email list. There's a pop-up there as soon as you get on. We notify you of new events. I, uh, there's going to be some new videos that will be coming out. And also we are, we have begun, and actually today was the first day we did our uh, online presentation for 2022, uh, where we talked about the glory of God, and that was exciting, and that was fun. So if you're interested in engaging in some live Zoom presentations, we do it twice a month on Saturday afternoons at 4 o'clock Eastern. Uh, you're more than willing, the more the merrier, and, and also it's a very casual approach in the sense that if you have questions, comments, um, you know, or you feel like the Lord has put something on your heart, 
we, we, we approach it that way. You know, this is where I say, you know, the body should be iron sharpens iron. And, and this is where we should all be growing with each other. So enough of all that. Let's get into this. Uh, which it's called the Head Crusher versus the Nephilim. This is part one of a two part series and uh, by Brian Del Turco of Jesus Smart. So take it away, Brian. And so we approach scripture humbly, open, and we approach our understanding of nature and history in the same way. At the end of this episode today, and this is part one of our conversation with Mark Russick, we have a short clip by Dr. Hugh Ross, PhD, astrophysicist, Christian apologist, and founder of Reasons to Believe. And I encourage you to go to jesusmart.com slash giants to see a video with Dr. Hugh Ross and one or two other Christian academics supporting this view that we're putting forth today on Genesis 6, 1 to 4. And you can also see scriptures there and links to other resources. And so I'm excited to bring you today's guest, Mark Russick. He's a professional who works in media, and he's a deep student of the Word, and he's an excellent teacher. And I look forward to future interaction with Mark. And Mark is going to give us an introduction into this topic today, sort of a survey introduction, which is going to call us to deeper study. Now, why study this? I like the saying, when in doubt, zoom out. This is big picture world stuff, in my opinion, and it very well may shape your understanding and deepen it concerning spiritual warfare, prayer, and your own unique kingdom contribution that you bring to the table. Well, I have bloviated long enough. Let's get right to it with Mark Russick. I am very motivated today about this topic that we're bringing to you and the guests that we have. We're going to be talking about, believe it or not, the very real possibility that angels impregnated women way back in early Genesis. And we're going to look at uh, how this could possibly inform our our faith, our prayer life, our point of view, our worldview, maybe scale up the kingdom contribution that we make. Thanks for carving out some time today to come on the podcast. I appreciate it. Delighted to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, we met through Stephen Lauterbach, and I began to look at some of Mark's content, and I've always instinctively believed what we're going to be talking today about out of Genesis 6. I haven't done in-depth, super in-depth study in this area. I think that our guest has. But before we get into that, Mark, just give our listeners a point of reference about you and what you do, a little bit about your background. Sure. Uh, I I was raised uh, in the Catholic Church, uh, traditional uh, altar boy, Catholic grammar school, Catholic high school, and instinctively, as time went by, you know, I, I believe I had that relationship with Jesus, but I thought that there was more than what I was uh what what I was learning at that point. So it began a journey of about 10 years where I started going to different churches, different denominations. Inevitably, I felt like the Lord was drawing me, that there was more. And uh, roughly around the time I was 30, um, I I just gave myself to the Lord. I I just could not walk away from the truth of his word. And and I was just hungry for more of him. Uh, And and then since, uh, you know, I began the journey of a lifetime that, uh, you know, is is just thrilling to me Uh, for professionally. um, I'm in uh, broadcast and media. I've been I've been involved in various forms of media for most of my professional life. And uh, so what what happened was I wound up uh, leading a uh, Bible study that. Uh, uh, because of COVID, we wound up having to go online and we were covering various topics. And, you know, through these people, they encouraged me to kind of get this information out there. One of the things, and I say this very humbly, that I believe the Lord has given me a gift as a teacher. Okay. So I wanted to use those gifts and uh, and in my studies and make presentations that makes it clear. My, my mission is really twofold. It's one, to engage the veracity of, of Christ and Scripture and the reality of that, but also by addressing the questions that the non-believers have, whether you're agnostic, you're sitting on the fence, or you were, or you fell, fall away from the faith, to engage in honest intellectual uh, conversation, because I believe that the church should have those answers, because you know, Jesus is the truth, and we should always be able to present the truth in a respectful manner. And then the second part of it is to offer information to the Christian that may be able to utilize some of this information in their sphere of influence 
uh, and sharing the gospel of Jesus. Yes, excellent. And I see, I understand in your content creation space that you deal a lot with current events, Christian apologetics, and really um, you have a value in presenting both sides of an argument, don't you? Um, enabling the listener to reach a conclusion. Um, we're really in a, post, a post-truth a time, aren't we? Exactly. I, I almost draw the equation of, uh, you know, if, if, if I'm presenting something to you and, and you need to make a purchase as, a, uh, uh, as an owner or somebody who may have something invested in it, you need to make an informed decision. And by that, you know, I like to present both sides of the argument and, uh, or bring up different areas. So in other words, that I'm not saying sp- or relying solely upon the Bible and the word of God, but I'm bringing other aspects into it, whether it's archaeological evidence, eyewitness accounts, historical accounts. Okay. It all plays into, uh, comes into being because inevitably the, the listener needs to make a decision. And I, I kind of equate them as being the jury. And, you know, so I'm presenting the case of the Lord Jesus Christ humbly, and, and let them make that decision whether this is truth or not. Yeah, very good. Let me read this passage out of Genesis 6, 1 to 4, and then I'd just like to ask you about our popular culture today seems to be interested in this topic by some of the uh, movies and television shows that they're creating. And then we'll come back and uh, really uh, dive into this topic, okay? Genesis 6, 1 to 4, it came about when mankind began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not remain with man forever because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of mankind and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. I think the word Nephilim from the Hebrew, am I right in that it means fallen ones and that some translations, including the Septuagint, the old Greek translation, translates that word as giants? Correct. Now, what do we have happening in popular culture today with any movies or shows that are being produced which show these hybrid creatures or these uh, whatever, part animal or maybe part animal, part human or part human, part angel creatures? Absolutely. Uh, you know, you the movies, but I know some of the uh, more popular ones could be Wolverine and that and that franchise. And, you know, you see them drawing uh, it's they, they kind of pit it as good versus evil. And, uh, you know, they, they have their part man, part animal part. You know, they, they have different attributes that are not natural to mankind. Yes. And uh, I think, you know, you see that in certainly in, in Hollywood and the movies, but you see also a lot of that television as well. Yeah. And sometimes it seems like the world is more open uh, to um, seeing things through a spiritual lens or a supernatural lens than much of the North American church. Is that an overstatement or I don't want to overstate? No, I, 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 you know, I, I think that's fair. I think... Uh, the well, I'll you know speak specifically as an American that you know we're bombarded with with media and information, and I, I would say almost a sensory overload, okay. and it and it dulls our senses into you know what is what is critical thinking and 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 the kind of uh, thwarting our ability to process information correctly, and and I think that's by intent and that's by design. Yeah, now there's this verse in Genesis 3.15, which I think theologians call the proto-evangelium or the first mention of the gospel, first mention of the gospel of the kingdom. God comes mm-hmm. on the scene immediately after the fall of Adam and Eve and says, "I will." Ma-, he, he's speaking now to Satan through the serpent. He says, I will make enemies of you <clears throat> and the woman and of your offspring and her descendant or her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the on the heel, the foot. 
again, the first mention of really a prophecy, right? Uh, a messianic it's prophecy. It's the first prophecy in the Bible. Absolutely. Okay, Genesis 3.15. Now, Satan obviously heard this. I'm wondering if we need to um, imagine what he felt like when he heard this, uh, what, sure. his, what his reaction may have been. And, and you're contending now, as we pick it up in Genesis 6, that Satan attempted to penetrate the human bloodline or the messianic bloodline and corrupt it and stop this from happening. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, you know, I think you, you will see that throughout the Bible that Satan attempted to thwart uh, the bloodline leading up to Jesus. But I would just kind of uh, shift the paradigm, if you will, for a second, where Genesis 3.15, this is really the Lord giving Satan his death sentence. Okay. Uh, it, it, it is the first prophecy in the Bible. And, you know, I, I think as Christians, we need to understand that Satan is obviously very much aware of who the Lord is, but he also knows the Bible probably better than a lot of people. So he understands what that means. And, you know, this is a life and death situation for him. And if he can thwart this attempt, uh, which is kind of silly if you think you're going to thwart the Lord, but nonetheless... You know, if, if you're being under attack, you're going to do everything you can to fight whatever it is that that's attacking you. And if he can thwart this from happening, that means in, in, in essence, he is really causing the Lord's word to not be true and not be correct, uh, which, you know, all bets are off, you know, at that point. So I see, in my opinion, that he's he began that stage by thwarting the bloodline leading up to the Messiah. And by that, I mean, uh, if you believe, as I do, that fallen angels went into the daughters of men and created this offspring, if you will, you're looking at the DNA that's a mutant DNA, that it's no longer human, it's part human and part angelic. And therefore, it is not the creation of God. So God has not created these Nephilim, and that DNA is, is now infested potentially into the, the bloodline of the human race. Yes, I understand. So take us through Genesis 6, 1 to 4. Let's let the listener consider this. I've been about 95% on this just instinctively over the years, plus there's some a uh, witness from the New Testament, which I believe uh, supports this interpretation. I understand there's three different models of interpretation of Genesis 6, 1 to 4. Maybe you could briefly take us through that survey and then begin to um, give support to your view that these were angelic beings who came down and had relations with women. Well, I, I think the three theories, I'll, we'll call them, are that the fallen angels are the sons of God or that they came from a godly line of Seth. And then there's the aspect of the mythological past. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but those are the three that I believe you're alluding to. And I would contend that these fallen angels are the sons of God uh, and, and the fallen sons of God. They, so you're, you're going back to, um, I, I don't want to go down a, a rabbit hole, but let's just say at this point before the fall of man, you had the fall of Satan. Yes. And uh, so if you look at Genesis 6, 4, it says there were Nephilim. And so the implication there is giants. And uh, I'll, I'll just briefly go through uh, what that means. Nephilim is fallen ones. It is a fallen spirit and their offspring. The, word, the root word is nephal. It means to be cast down, to fall away. Okay. Uh, then there is Haba Gibeon, which is the mighty ones. And when this was translated into Greek, it is jihantes, or Hispanics would know it as jihantes. So they're giants, and there's so many records uh, in human history of recordings of these giants. Then if you continue, it says, in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God. So we have Nephilim, sons of God, those are the fallen angels, came into the daughters of men, human women. Mm -hmm. So right there in that, in that opening verse, there's a clear distinction between what the Nephilim are, what the sons of God are, and what the daughters of men are. So you have the, the three classifications, well, I'll say part human, part angelic, then sons of God being angelic, and daughters of men being human, 
women. Okay. So this was the early view, wasn't it, of the early church and the early centuries of church history and even uh, late Judaism before the incarnation of Christ. Wasn't this the dominant view that these were angels? Who came That's down. correct. Yeah, that, that is correct. And then maybe later, beginning with Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, and you know, you could look up maybe a modern uh, theologian today who would believe that th- this is the godly line of Seth. It's referring to the godly line of Seth who came in and married the daughters of Cain, right? Two different yep. lines, and that God was displeased with that. But there are also theologians today. I was amazed, uh, Mark. I, you know, sometimes when I'm looking at a topic initially, what I'll do is grab three mainline uh, study Bibles and I'll just look at the study. Mm-hmm. And I'll just, I was amazed at both, all, all three the John MacArthur Study Bible, which is quite scholarly, the mm-hmm. uh, Spirit Filled Life Bible, Jack Hafer, general editor, again, scholarly, and the, um, uh, what is it? The, um, uh, Nelson, uh, New King James Version Study mm-hmm. Bible, all three held to the ancient view. I was a little shocked, you know? Yeah. I, I, was, yeah. I was expecting uh, that, you know, there would be this more modern view of, of Seth. But, okay, so angels, and we're going back to the Hebrew word Nephilim, and then this phrase, sons of God, um, appears what, five or six times in the Old Testament? Am I right? Um, about that. I know you see that throughout the book of Job, uh, Luke, and I don't know whether we'll talk about this or not, uh, even though it is not canonized, but the book of Enoch makes yeah. reference to it. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and depending upon what you're reading, it can mean uh, something, something else. In other words, uh, sons of God are, are, it could be a reference to to Adam because Adam was a son of God. He was created by God, mm-hmm. uh, but then we are called the sons of Adam. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, like in Job one six and seven, for example, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Yep. Well, well, this is a, the exact Hebrew phrase, obviously referring to some form of spiritual beings or angels. Again, in Job 2, 1, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And then in Job 38, 7, when, the morning, when God is confronting uh, Job and talking about creation, you know, where were you when I did all this, that, that, that whole uh, conversation that God had with Job. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, that's at the creation process. Yep. Again, angels. I don't know how you feel about Daniel 3. It's an Aramaic passage, but when Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace, he sees uh, four men instead of three untied and walking about, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Do you do you see that fourth one as a Christophany, an appearance of Christ, or would you possibly? I do. I, I'll, I'll do, I, do. Okay. I, I see. I see that as Jesus. Okay. All right. Refers there to um, as that same Hebrew phrase, sons of God. So it seems to me the the research I have done, and I have looked at some credible sources uh, on this. It seems that unanimously, this particular Hebrew phrase, sons of God unanimously uh, refers to angels in Old Testament mm-hmm. passages. Yep. Um, okay, maybe with the exception of this Daniel 3 passage. Uh, and, and, and again, that's that's up for interpretation. You know, uh, I, I can't say that definitively, and, uh, you know, it's really a topic for another time, but the way yeah, I, I have my reasons I, for believing I've that's always, Jesus. I've always believed that was a Christophany, too, and, and so it's not a human, that's for sure, right? I mean, it's not a, right. exactly. it's not a exactly. son of Seth or any other kind of human. Okay. So, so you have that that argument of the he- Hebrew, and and you know what, Mark, I wanted to get your thought on this because I'm a, I think you're a full full on believer in an exegetical approach to Scripture and interpreting it through a like a historical, cultural, grammatical sort of a hermeneutic, right? Yeah. Um, and soundness, a high, very high view of Scripture. I also want to make the case, you know, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will teach you all things; He will bring you into truth. And, you know, John says in First John, I was just reading it the other day in my own reading, that you all have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. I would really love to just see a blending of a historical, grammatical, cultural interpretation as a hermeneutic, but also blending it with a full-on engagement with the Holy Spirit, right, to mm-hmm. help us to know by revelation, to ins- to illuminate the scriptures to us. And so I, I would just 
encourage uh, the listener to just don't merely do inductive Bible study, you know, and not give credence to the person of the Holy Spirit to help bring illumination. What? Any thoughts on that? Sort of a sidebar, but any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think it's so important to, you know, you know, we, we, we prayed and we asked for the Holy Spirit to, to guide this conversation. And there, there's so much that we know, but, you know, the Lord is, is, is just so rich, so vast, so deep. And I'm sure you understand this, where if you look at a scripture and you see it maybe 10 times, and then all of a sudden, a year later, you see another side of it. Absolutely. And that illumination comes from Holy Spirit. Scripture also shows us that the angels circle the throne room of the Lord, and each time they circle, they see something new. Like, the Lord is so fresh, so clear, um, that His revelation and the depth of which, you know, is available to us, we would be foolish in my opinion, not to engage a Holy Spirit and ask him for revelation, ask him to shift our paradigm and kind of see things or read things the way from his perspective. Absolutely. I mean, those angels, how can they keep crying out, holy, 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 like forever? Because they keep seeing another facet, right, of God. That's what you're saying. Yeah, and they can't, that's exactly right. They, they can't help it. And it's like that with the extraordinary nature of the, the Bible inspired God breathed and always rooting ourselves in sound scholarship. You're always going to see difference in scholarship, of course, different interpretations. And, but if you can find a strong dose of scholarship and it resonates with what you feel the Holy Spirit might be saying to you, I think you're in a safe space there with um, deep Bible study. At least that's how I see it. So now I agree. Now, what about the New Testament witness? Why don't you talk about the passage in Jude and also Second Peter 2? Sure. I, I believe you're alluding to Jude 6, where it says, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So this would be an account to the sons of God, the fallen angels. But what's interesting here is it says left their proper domain. Although we don't necessarily understand exactly, or at least I don't, what that means is, but let's just say that they have an assigned area of which they can operate from, Mm -hmm. even though that this is after the fall of Satan. And they've defied that and left. And the implication is they went down to Mount Hebron and uh, um, engaged in, in, in fornication with women and basically raped them. Because of that sin, he has put them into, and later it goes into Peter, uh, put them in Tartarus, which is what's called a level below what we would associate as hell. And then Second uh, Peter 4, and, and I believe this is what you're alluding to, and if not, you can... You yeah. Certainly yeah. clarify me. It says, uh, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell or Tartarus and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, which inevitably is the great white throne judgment. And, and, and I think that's what you're pointing to. Yes. There you have New Testament account of what was revealed in Genesis, but it's kind of a, a little bit of a further elaboration uh, specifically really from, from Jude, where he says they left their proper domain. Yeah. And even back in the June, the Jude passage, um, the verse you read, verse six, and then it says in verse seven, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these angels indulged in sexual perversion and went after strange flesh are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Now, the New American Standard has the word angels, I guess, italicized. The translators have added that. They, they believe that's what it's referring to. Back to mm-hmm. verse 6. But what are your uh, thoughts on verse 7 in Jude as it as it um, uh, builds upon verse 6? Read that, read that passage again, verse 7. I don't have that in front of me. I just yeah. want to make sure. Well. I'll, I'll start with verse six, if if, uh, if that's good. Yep. A- angels, yep. who, angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper dwelling place. These he has kept in eternal restraints under darkness for the judgment of the great day, comma, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these angels indulged in sexual perversion and went after strange flesh, 
mm-hmm. are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. I don't know if, if the strange flesh is a reference to the homosexuality in Sodom and Gomorrah, or if it's also well, it, it could it could certainly point to that, but it's cert- you know at the very least it points to a sexual perversion. And what's what I would say is if you, is you look at I believe it's Luke when the disciples ask him what will be the signs of your coming in the last days. And he says, it will be as in the days of Noah and as in the days of Lot. Uh, so I, I, I really think that's kind of what... Ah, the statement by Jesus also includes Lot? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, that's a fresh reminder for me. Uh, I believe it's Luke. There, there's two passages in the Gospels, and, and I'm going to say Matthew and Luke. Yeah. It's Luke 17. Okay. Um, well, but you know yes. what? On the show notes page, we're going to put all these scriptures and some helpful links to dive further. We always like to put a go deeper section. So listening to this, you're going to have that on the show notes page. Okay. Yep. It, take some time with this and study. You know, I mean, uh, it's, you're not going to do this in like one 60 minute session of study, but if you open up a thread of deeper Bible study on certain themes like this, it could be amazing. It could really be amazing. So even in that instance in Sodom and Gomorrah, one scholar, uh, one authority said that in Genesis 6, you have the angels initiating and going after human flesh. In Sodom and Gomorrah, there's almost an inversion of it. You have the humans, at least in the account there, wanting to have sexual relations with the angels who had come to visit Lot, right? Yep, that's exactly right. They were ready to tear the door off to, to, to get after it, if I could put it that way. Wow. Okay, so then in Second Peter 4... You're saying that God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, committed them to pits of darkness, held for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but protected Noah. All of this just precipitated Noah's flood, right? Yeah, um, that's and correct. Then, and then verse 6, he, you know, he mentions Sodom and Gomorrah. He condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by destruct- to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example of what is coming for the ungodly. Um, amazing. So some New Testament witness or support for this interpretation of Genesis 6, 1 to 4, linking it back to Genesis 3, 15, also looking at how the Hebrew phrase sons of God is used throughout the Old Testament. Now, what about Enoch? And I would just add New Testament, but plus Jesus saying it as well. The premier part of the New, the New Testament witness, right? Jesus' statement. Again, quote that verse um, Quote that statement, if you would, Mark, about the days of Noah. Luke 17, 26. Uh, Just as as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up until the day that Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Okay, so the days of Noah, you have every sort of sin going on, right? Covetousness, murder, hatred, and also this egregious sin in this interpretation of angels coming down, crossing a a barrier and having sexual relations with women. And we'll talk about how this can happen, like physically what is the reproductive system we can touch on this because i know people might be wondering about that but and then also mentioning uh sodom and gomorrah later with abraham after the flood tremendous yeah. sin going on homosexuality and again this instance in that account that we have to think about they're going after those angels humans are wanting to have sexual relations with those angels amazing so now what about enoch Enoch is quoted in Jude, right? Is Enoch quoted yeah. anywhere else in the New Testament? Well, it's mentioned in Hebrew. So let's so yes. New Testament, Jude one, uh, Jude that would be it. It says also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord come with ten thousands of his holy ones. So Jude is quoting the book of Enoch. Yeah. And uh, Hebrews 11, 5 just alludes to Enoch where it says, by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. Yeah. And it, it, give, it gives witness to him that he was pleasing to God there. In Correct. Hebrews 11, 5, and God translated him. It's really a, a, a pre-foreshadowing of the rapture, right? Correct. Okay. So then Enoch, Enoch talks in quite, quite some detail about, about Genesis 6, 1 to 4 and, wh- and what he believes happened there. Absolutely. Enoch, so the book of Enoch goes into great detail.
friend, here's that promised audio excerpt from Dr. Hugh Ross of Reasons to Believe, Who Wore the Nephilim? Now, some people would say, though, there's some weird things happening in Genesis chapters 1 through 11. One of those things is the mention of these mysterious people called the Nephilim in Genesis chapter 6. So if you believe that's real history, start to walk us through what do you think is happening there? Well, like with any controversial issue in the Bible, you want to look at all 66 books, not just what you see in Genesis 6. And it turns out this subject pops up again and again as you look at other books of Scripture. So it's something I've done in navigating Genesis to actually provide the reader with all the relevant passages and the rest of Scripture and basically challenge them to read them and draw their own conclusion. So who do you think the Nephilim are? Because they kind of are tied into the flood account with Noah. They, they happen right before that, before we're introduced to Noah. So what do you think is going on there? Well, it says in Genesis 6 that they were present before the flood and after the flood. So there's two inputs of the Nephilim going on. And what you see in Genesis 6 is that they're the result of the sons of God visiting the daughters of men. And evidently this was happening before the flood and happened after the flood. And as you go on in the rest of the chronologies of the Bible, you see they show up again often with different names, like the Anakites or the Raphaim and the Nephilim. They're all interchangeable terms. And what you notice is the last appearance you see of them is in the uh, King David. King David's mighty men wiped out the last of the Nephilim. They're tall. I mean, the shortest one we see mentioned is Goliath, and using the shortest possible cubit in uh, Hebrew measure, he's at least nine feet, nine inches tall. Then you got the king of Bashan, who had a bed that was at least 13 feet long, made out of iron. So these were big people. The other thing you notice is no mention of women. They're all men. And they have birth defects, like six fingers and six toes. We also know they're all evil. Uh, none of them are good. And, uh, but they were mighty men in battle. And they were a threat uh, to the uh, emerging Hebrew nation and Hebrew religion. So that's why God set up uh, you know, a procedure where they could be eliminated from the human race. Go to Jude 6. Jude 6 talks about a subcategory of evil angels, the fallen angels, the demons, who left their estate. And because they left their estate, they were consigned to the abyss, a place that the demons don't like at all. It's what's quite clear when you read the Gospels. Every time Jesus cast out demons, it don't send us to the abyss. Jude is indicating it's a special place for demons who cross the line. Well, it's a very interesting hypothesis, and I know that there are other competitors. Right, uh, this right. isn't the only one. What would be your recommendation as people study Genesis 6 for themselves, how to think this through? Well, what I did in navigating Genesis is lay out the three predominant hypotheses, give people the scripture passages, and tell them, read these passages and draw your own conclusion. You can go to the show notes page at jesussmart.com slash giants. If you listen to this podcast, as soon as it goes live on the feeds, it may take a few hours for that page to go live. So please be patient with that. Come back to it. jesussmart.com slash giants. You can learn more about Mark Russick. You can see the video by Dr. Hugh Ross, a few other videos there, links to other resources, scriptures to go deeper. That's your call to action, okay? Go to jesussmart.com slash giants. Stay connected with the podcast. We're going to have part two of this conversation with Mark in our next episode. And you can stay connected by going to jesussmart.com. We're looking to create even more digital pathways and resources there to inspire, to inform, to equip, and to do our best to follow Christ and play our role in helping to catalyze those who are called to listen to this content, catalyze them into their role, into their function at a higher level in the body of Christ. You can subscribe and be notified when new episodes go live. There's a free e-letter which goes out from time to time updating you about new things and resources. Hey, we are all seeking to level up with Christ following. Following Christ is a quest of humility and inclining our ear learning, developing, growing. That's the quest that we're all pursuing. 
Thank you for passing this episode along to your friends and contacts. The best syndication is always your personal touch, your personal connection, you reaching out to your network. He's the most brilliant person in the universe, the most brilliant in cosmic history, the most brilliant person to walk the planet. The future belongs to him. He knows how life works best right now. And that horizon that's coming, it's owned entirely in totality by the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And so let's align with that right now. 